Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com. I'm here at Maker Fair 2014 with Sean Thorson. We met you a couple years ago. You made this giant Warhammer yes. armor suit, yep. but this year you have something that's not wearable, but even more impressive. It's Ed 209 from Robocop. This looks like the real thing. So how this project come about? Um, originally, it's just been something I've wanted ever since I was a little kid. You know, as soon as you see the thing walking around in the movie, it's like, oh my God, wow, I must have this. Nobody makes it. Well, I can make it. There's no reason why not. Uh, it's been a project I've been toying with for quite a few years. I finally got to sitting down and the folks at Make Magazine asked me to document a build through their website. So we've been doing this for, it worked out to be 96 days. They send someone out to interview me every other week and get updates on the project. And the whole thing came together on Thursday night was the first time we had it all stacked up before we threw it in the truck. That was two days ago. 96 days seems like a really short time to build something this massive. It seems like you've been using all the skills you've learned and polished over the years building your replicas to get this far. So let's talk about Ed 209. We've been to Fit Tippett Studio and there is on the shelf somewhere a full-size Ed 209. They made one for Robocop in 1985. How close is this to that and what kind of reference did you use? Um, as far as how close, I, I had to gauge the scale based on just screen captures from the film, uh, a couple of scattered references from around the internet, and folks that I know who've actually been and seen the original. Um, I didn't bother going over there to take measurements myself. I don't know anyone that can get me in the door just yet. But uh, based on all of that, I had a rough idea of the scale that I wanted. And then the next thing I stumbled across was a uh, Nika action figure, which they claim is one-tenth scale. Um, the problem is, if I actually scaled this up to one-tenth, or sorry, 10 times its original size, it works out to be just a shade under seven feet tall. And in the film, the way that they have it shot, it usually looks like it's significantly bigger than that. So seven feet tall, it's a little bit bigger than any person that's gonna walk by. Um, I started you know, kind of tweaking a little bit of the measurements and trying to come up with what makes it imposing enough to give you the same feel you had in a film when you see it in person. Finally settled on a scale factor of 10.6. So it actually ends up being just about seven and a half feet tall, which gives you the same kind of feeling and same kind of you know presence and power by the time it actually stands in front of you. Because so, you don't know how accurate this is and what references they had. And so it's a combination of the screen caps and behind the scenes photos that you could dig up. Right. And so scale was the first thing. And what, what, was thing. what was next after that? After the first thing, uh, after deciding on the scale, the next thing was just picking out processes as far as what to make it out of. Mm. So um, the, the prototypes were actually done out of things like MDF and styrene and just, just really horrible materials that I could work with in a hurry and use uh, a lot of that had to be inexpensive. So the prototypes are all these parts that uh, I've actually painted them as instantly recognizable bright pink parts. And um, all of these, I mean, you can see it just sitting outside, the weather's kind of taking them apart already. Um, once I had the, the prototype parts for the big pieces, the next step was to pull molds and fiberglass and actually lay up all the you know lightweight, big, open parts. Because you didn't want it to be full of MDF and styrene. That's real heavy no, yeah, over it's time. It's really heavy, and I mean, just getting wet and things going to start falling apart. You know, as you can see, I mean, everywhere the paint's peeling is a seam that's about to come apart when yeah. I you know set it down the wrong way. So the, the fiberglass molding, actually see one of my molds here. It's a little on the rough side. Again, it's a very rushed build, so we didn't have time to really polish up most of the, uh, the actual molds. Um, but once the, uh, once the molds were made, it's just a question of you know, getting them all polished up on the inside and then laying up another glass part on the inside. You pop that off and you've actually got copies here. Now, by comparison, it's built exactly the same way as you built, you know, uh, like a sailboat or whatever. It's it's fairly sturdy. It's very lightweight. Um, the gel coat on the outside is UV stabilized. So you don't have to worry about it rotting in the weather. Um, so this thing, I mean, you know, it'll it'll outlast me by a long time. I want to talk about detail. There's a lot of different textures and finishes and a lot of like gun turret detail. Right. Now, how did you go about replicating that stuff? Mostly just guessing. Uh, the biggest parts, like I say, it's all fiberglass for the big shells. For some of the small parts, um, it's really, again, just a question of looking at screen captures, looking at the model, trying to guess what they probably used. Um, so there's actually a section of a radiator that was carved out to be made into the grill for the mouth. Uh, there's some vacuum form styrene parts to get some of the lightweight you know, shells that I need for bigger parts that aren't quite as detailed as some of the little things. And then when you start looking at like these socket cap screws, I actually went to the hardware store, bought a socket cap screw, pulled a silicone mold, cast copies in your urethane resin, uh, the gun barrels are urethane resin, um, you know, there's, there's just tons of little tiny things all over it um, that probably were found parts in 1985, yeah. but nowadays, you know, I don't want to guess what kind of weird little hardware thing they might have found in the back of some electronics junk shop, so there's, a lot of it was just eyeball it, pull measurements, you know, draw up a thing, make it out of, you know, scraps or whatever. Um, there are two parts that I finally just gave up on and had to make on the 3D printer, so it's uh, this tiny little detail right here 
where the gun uh, barrels actually come together, and then the little silver details on the front of the pelvis. And how, how much does this break down into for transport? Uh, all told, you know, I didn't actually count. Um, the dome comes off so that we can get into the inside if we need to. Um, the main body and the shoulders are attached together, but I can pull the arms off on either side. Um, once the main body comes off of the pelvis section, there's a cover at the hip joint on each side, so the pelvis comes off of the thighs, the thighs come off of the lower legs, um, the leg itself from the cap down to the toe is one part, but the feet can actually be pulled off so we can break it into separate pieces. Underneath the, uh, the fiberglass shells for the toes, there's a couple of lead bricks on either side that actually keep it from toppling over if somebody bumps into it. Uh, it is a little top heavy, even though it looks like it's several tons of war machine, it's really just a bunch of very lightweight shells. It looks so detailed. I mean, this is made to be impressive in person, which the original wasn't made to. It's made to look good on film for just 10 seconds. So Sean, is this thing just static or is it supposed to move? The original plan was just static. The, the, the whole thing all the way along this build, I've been promising I'm going to deliver one static robot. Um, along the way, I caught my dad in a board uh, time you know, where he was in a welding mood. So all of a sudden, instead of the wooden frame I had planned, it actually ended up with a steel skeleton underneath. Based on that, I was able to actually install a couple of actuators you know, to, to get some movement. So there is actually a motor that'll pivot it at the waist. Um, there's another one which doesn't have nearly enough power that'll actually elevate the pelvis so the whole thing can look up and down a little bit. The elbows have actuators so they can bend uh, and above, uh, below the knee joint we can actually extend the leg about three inches. It's very slow, it's a little wobbly, scares me, I don't actually want to run that part. But the rest of it, as soon as we can get the programming done for the controller, someone can hide in the back and actually use like a PS2 controller to at least turn it, get the elbows to bend. It does make a little noise. Yeah. And, and what happens after this is all done? You're going to take it on towards the victory lap and it's going to sit in your living room? Um, well, I live on a boat, so there's no living room. Uh, but when it's all done, uh, usually I'll have all of my crew that, you know, help me out with the whole project. We do kind of a thank you barbecue, get together, tell horror stories about, you know, how many times we cut ourselves open on fiberglass shards. Um, so it'll be sitting in the front lawn at my folks' place where I, you know, will host that. And then when that's over, um, the folks at Make actually mentioned that I can park it in their lobby for a while until I, you know, decide where else I'm going to put it. And sometime in the next couple of years, I'll probably end up with actually a house again. And uh, when that happens, it'll end up in the house. And what's awesome is that you've documented everything yes. for Make People Hunt videos and write-ups on how you actually replicated a life-size Ed 209 for Maker Fair 2014. Thank you so much, Sean. This is incredible. We'll have more incredible things from Maker Fair this year on Tested. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.